Hello, welcome to the Wildline Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. This is a podcast about movies and how much money they make at the box office. Um, so I talked about the last couple of weeks have sort of been not necessarily dreading these upcoming weekends here through the Labor Day weekend, um, but I have sort of warned people that it's going to be quiet, right? There is not a lot happening, not a lot of major movies coming out um, this weekend or next weekend. Basically, we're in a standstill until it hits theaters on the 8th of September. Uh, and that's, you know, projected to do well over $50 million, uh, at least I'm thinking more like 80, but that's the next big sort of bump we have going on here. Um, this weekend was as slow as expected. Um, it's actually been making the headlines here in the last couple of days. I believe, um, the sort of byline that people are using, it's the worst weekend at the box office. Um, since right after 9-11. So sort of a historically shitty um, time at the box office. There's just nothing coming out. Um, uh, it's August. There's a ton of reasons why this weekend has done so poorly. Um, the May uh, Mayweather-McGregor fight, um, which actually was in the top 10 movies that the, this weekend at the box office, which I will walk through. Um, later on the show, but I did kind of want to start out um, just discussing a bit about um, how bad this summer has been at the box office. There's been a lot of articles written, especially in the last couple of weeks, and there's going to be more written after these uh, these this weekend and the next weekend as they're not going to they're not going to get any better. So um, there will be a lot said about um, oh, it, the world's ending, or hey, it's really not that bad. There's always this push and pull about um, articles detailing the box office. You know, some from people who don't really understand how it works, uh, but it's good for clickbait to say, hey, the, the sky is falling, uh, nobody goes to movies anymore, and stuff like that. But uh, as much as I don't want to be a Cassandra, and sort of say, hey, there is a huge problem here. Uh, hey, there might be a big problem here, is essentially what I'm saying. Um, and the reason I say that is it's not just because of this weekend, right? This weekend was historically terrible. Um, the overall box office was only $69 million. Uh, last year, it was 117. So even just looking at last year, you're off 48 million dollars uh, which isn't great um, but the fact that it was so depressed and you have to go back to you know 16 years ago to find a, a comparable and that's it's even worse than that because they didn't I don't think they adjusted for inflation for those numbers um, so this this 69 million dollar number for the weekend is especially terrible um, and the reason I find and if it was just one weekend, if it was just um, uh, you know just an off weekend, nothing major came out. The only thing that was released this weekend were a couple of smaller releases. Um, you could say, hey, look, it's just an off weekend, not a big deal. Um, the problem is that this has basically continued um, a box office collapse that started in June. Um, that a lot of the articles that are out talking about how bad this box office was this summer don't really look at the details, right? Um, probably because they're not nerdy enough. Um, you just have to you have to be to find like the real answers in the data. You just have to be a total nerd and look at things super closely uh, with an obsessive level of detail. And a lot of people write in the box office. And this is nothing to say anything against them. Uh, it's just an assignment that they have. Uh, they find a story uh, and they write about a story to get clicks uh, to increase their adver advertising revenue. Um, them being right doesn't really matter that much to them, right? What they want is um, a, a, a kind of a big story that will pull people in. Uh, they want they want to tell a narrative that will hook people in and get the click, and then they are more successful as a writer, right? I mean, that's just how the business of online journalism works, uh, for better or for worse. So they tend to overlook some of the more relevant details um, 
and, and sort of just gloss over maybe what's really happening, right? But uh, the thing that that has been going around constantly um, the last few weeks is this summer's box office has just been terrible. Uh, and then they go off on all these reasons about perhaps why it's happening. I haven't seen anybody really look closely at why it's so bad and what really happened week to week. And I was um, speaking of the May- Mayweather and Mer- uh, McGregor fight. Uh, I was bored uh, waiting for it to start. And, you know, of course, the thing was delayed until midnight on the East Coast. We all know this is going to happen. But I got bored and started looking at the weekly numbers. Uh, for the box office this summer, or actually the entire year, uh, and I noticed there were some really interesting patterns. And you know, I think it's important to dive into this stuff uh, as deeply as you can or as you want to uh, to find out sort of um, not necessarily what's quote unquote really happening, um, but to get a fuller picture of of how this year has played out. Um, and I you know, and I'll walk through kind of the general. Uh, patterns that I saw. Um, You know, earlier in this year, it seemed like it was doing really well. It seemed like we had Split, um, we had Get Out, we had Beauty and the Beast. Um, Everything before Beauty and the Beast, it felt like the winter season uh, was doing pretty well. Um, But if you look at the numbers on a week-by-week basis, through March 2nd of this year, through March 2nd, uh, the box office was actually off about $145 million. Um, so in reality, the start of this year was actually not great. You know, it was off quite a lot of money um, for where it was last year. Now, last year, uh, you had Force Awakens, right? So this would have been the winter of 2016. So Force Awakens obviously played very, very well through January. I guess it probably played pretty well through February, too. Um, so that definitely pumped up the box office a bit. But the numbers don't lie, right? For this year, we are off $144 million going into March. Then we had this unbelievable March. Um, and just for those, let's say, the five weeks of March. Um, and the way that they do weeks on Box Office Mojo, it's basically Friday through Thursday. Um, so it's, you know, it's, that's how they basically calculate the seven day week starts out with the weekend. Um, you know, through April, um, well, I actually just, if you're just, just looking at March this year, uh, versus last year, uh, the box office is up $250 million. I mean, think about that. Just an absolute ridiculous, uh, boom from Beauty and the Beast. Just fantastic. Um, And, you know, by the time you get to April here, comparing the overall year to last year, we were up 103 million bucks. You know, so the first part of the year was looking kind of rough. Then Beauty and the Beast happens. And now, wow, this is great. Now we're up 103. Things are going well. We're going to the summer. You know, it's going to be it could be a good year here for the box office. And for all intents and purposes, when you looked at the summer on paper, you were probably thinking, and a lot of analysts were thinking, hey, this looks pretty good. Like you have all of these returning major movie franchises like Pirates, uh, like Transformers, the sequel to Guardians, get Wonder Woman coming out, you got Spider Man. It kind of looked stacked, to be honest with you. Uh, now, obviously, later in the summer, I was like, hmm, not sure what's going on, not sure if Dark Towers really connect with people. Um, but it didn't look like a 2014 summer. And 2014 is like the ultimate example of just a terrible, terrible summer. Uh, and I'll talk more a little bit about 2014 in a bit. Um, but through April of this year, uh, we were up $100 million in the box office. Just keep that in mind. So, you know, by the time we're getting a little bit closer towards that summer season, we're doing pretty well. Uh, and then in April, um, compared to last year, tough off 151 um, million bucks just in the month of April. So by the time we hit that first week of May, um, we're still up 168, or sorry, we're still up about $70 million total. Um, so not not terrible. Um, 
you know, not a breakout year so far, but sort of like doing pretty well, you know, going into the the real summer seasons. You know, I consider summer to be essentially the month of May through about middle to the end of August. I don't really do the whole, you know, to Labor Day thing. I don't know. It seems like the box office um, goes through a transition period this weekend and next weekend um, that you can count as summer and why not, but... Um, the real meat of it starts in May through the first couple of weeks in August. Um, so in May of this year, compared to last year, um, we were pretty even. We're only about off about 14 million bucks, which is you know pretty tiny comparatively. Um, so by you know for the first part of uh, the summer here, and this is mostly due to Guardians of the Galaxy Two. Um, overall, by the time you get to June 1st, or the first week in June, whatever you want to call it, um, the box office in 2017 is up about $95 million over 2016. Again, pretty pretty bright story. Again, not a breakout, but things are going pretty well. Um, I think, you know, studios would be happy. Things are on the up. People are going back to the theater. Everybody's really excited. Um, and this is where this level of detail is what you're probably not going to normally get in any box office article. Um, even the ones written for Forbes or anything like that, and sometimes even Box Office Mojo, like uh, it's easier just to take a look at the big chunks of data and say, hey, here's the trend. Hey, here's what happened. If I was writing an article in uh, June 1st or the first week of June this year, I'd be like, hey, box office is doing great this year due to a strong spring. That's the byline. You know, tough start to the year a little bit. Beauty and the Beast, get out, crushed it in March. Um, and Guardians did really well. That's why we're sitting at about $100 million surplus in the box office compared to last year. Now, then you can go on and talk about how last year was to everybody else. But I think it's it's interesting just to look at a year-by-year basis here and see what's going on in terms of the, the trend. Um... And then, you know, June is actually not that bad. And this is where it starts to get interesting. Um, so June overall, um, and let's just use the four weeks in the middle of June, only down about 33 million bucks from last year. So not terrible. Um, not great, though. Uh, June was a little bit light. Um what kind of saved June, I think, was the performance of Wonder Woman, especially later in the month, because I believe it opened in the early part of June. Um, and then the legs, and the legs are still going right now. I mean, it's over $400 million. It, that, Wonder Woman is kind of the counter narrative to this summer, right? Like people expected it to do maybe 250, I think was the, the expectation. Um, you know, maybe open at like 70, maybe, maybe 80, uh, and end up at like a 250 ish, maybe a little bit higher than that. The fact that it blew past 300 and then somehow legged it out over 400 to me, that is the uh, the story of the summer that and girls trip. But I'll talk about that later. Um, so June was a pretty, a little bit of a mild loss overall, but, you know, kept buoyant by uh, Wonder Woman's performance. So, you know, by the time you get to July, um, and July 4th, um, you're looking, you're looking pretty decent. You're not looking too bad. Problems start to set in though, on that last week of June. Um, the June 23rd week. And I'm, I'm getting granular, folks. This is a nerdy podcast. We're going week by week. Uh, so buckle up. Um, the week of June 23rd, and whatever corresponding week that would have been to last year, and they'd kind of do it by numbers. It's like week 30 of the year, or week 25, whatever. Um, so the cracks start to appear, right? June 23rd to 29th was off $150 million alone that week alone it was off 150 million bucks so that pretty much wipes out any advantage that was already there right through june sort of the june 22nd week we were up 209 million overall at the box office 209 million a nice huge jump from last year that one week the next week in june that last week of june essentially 
um, why almost completely wipes out that advantage. Um, so at that point, um, by the time you're hitting July 4th weekend, uh, the box office box office is only up about a $61 million from last year. So a big reversal pretty quickly all of a sudden, right? Um, and then, and this is what I haven't really read in a lot of articles and what I found interesting was that then the box office crashes, right? You could say that one week was the start of the crash, and I think that it is. From that one week forward, uh, the June 23rd week of this year, the box office never really recovers. There's one week where it does a little bit better than it did last year, but for all intents and purposes, every week is a loss, and some of these losses are pretty massive. So by the time you get to this last weekend, starting from that June 23rd weekend where it really took a hit right before the July 4th um, weekend coming in uh, until this last weekend, the box office was off a loss of 670 million, 670 million from last year. Um, And that's not including this weekend. If you include this weekend, which was just, honestly, we've already talked about one of the worst in the last 20 years, um, it's a loss of $665 million compared to last year. Um, and it's not going to get better. You know, every day this week's going to be bad, and next weekend's going to be pretty horrific end to the uh, official end to the summer. So what, you know, and this is like when I was reading this stuff in the box office and how it was doing this summer and getting to fights online with people and all the nerds about like what was happening. Um, I think the overall story that the media wants to tell is, hey, things aren't going great. uh, And then list some reasons why. And it's always the reasons why that you're going to hear. Like uh, TV is so good now. It is such a strong competition. Game of Thrones was this summer. So they're going to say that's maybe why it was depressed. Uh, There's more streaming options with Netflix and Amazon, all the million other streaming services that are that are available now these days. And essentially, that comes down to competition. Right. There's a lot of competition. Um, The the old standby prices are too high at the movie theater, which is, you know, it's all sort of relative. Um, And it's it's sort of like there's a greatest hits element uh, when people are talking about the box office. Um, If you take a big step back, big, big step back and look at the movie industry and the box office in general, um, the number of tickets sold essentially peaked in the modern era um, in about, I believe, the 2003, 2004 um, years. And they've kind of been dwindling since then. That was just a big boom for movies for whatever reason. Um, I'm not going to get into why, or I could probably write a book about why. Um, But that was a big boom, and we're sort of just settling down on a a descent here from that high. Um, And then, you know, if you want to take even a bigger step back, uh, movies are completely different now than they were 50, 60 years ago. Um, You know, when... Uh, the average person went to the movies a lot, lot more than they do now, right? A ton more than they do now. If you look at a chart of um, movie theater attendance uh, just in the United States, if you look at it from like the 1930s on, it's like starts up at Mount Everest and just collapses until you get to now. Um, So, you know, as a business and as a medium, entertainment medium, it has definitely um, settled down in a more sort of niche area than it used to be, right? Uh, and it's continuing to go through these changes. And one of the changes it's always going through is trying to um, compete in a, in a very crowded market space for people's wallets and people's minds, essentially, and their interests and their eyeballs. Um, you know, and every, every time there's a big change in entertainment, um, whether it be TV, cable TV, VHS, DVD, um, you know, streaming, Netflix, those are all the ones that I've been alive for to see happen. There's always this sort of will movie theaters survive this change, right? It's like this endless narrative. And the people who follow 
um, the box office and the movie industry are uh, have gotten so grizzled and cynical about these articles that sometimes they can't see the forest for the trees. And I think that that's what's sort of happening now. We're getting all these articles about how the box office was very was kind of shitty this summer, and a lot of the people in the industry are like, "Ah, it's whatever, it's fine." Um, something seems just a little bit different about this. Uh, and when I was looking at this week to week sort of comparison to last year and the patterns that I just talked about. Uh, it seemed a little bit more severe than the normal depressed box office. Like 2014 was an awful year at the box office, uh, especially I mean an awful summer. Um, even compared to last year, um, this year is up 250 million bucks from 2014. Right, so you know you could you could definitely say, well, 2014 was terror was much was worse. Maybe not much worse was worse. Not only in tickets sold, but in box office revenue. So therefore, and things were bounded, therefore they will bound again. I think that might be a little bit, um, I don't know. It seems a little bit wrong-minded, uh, if, that, if that's an appropriate term. Um, the comparison between this year and 2014 Just because they're both off years of the box office, sure, you can compare the two, um, but just because 2015 happened and things really bumped up doesn't mean 2018 is going to be the same as 2015, right? It seems like a false equivalency on some level. Um, And 2014 was a lot weaker overall, week in, week out, uh, as opposed to this year where the losses were very... Um, we're confined to a narrow band of the summer, right? And so it almost seems like a more catastrophic and sudden sort of like box office sinkhole and collapse. And that's sort of what I'm calling it because that's what it seems like. When you look at this data and you you sort of look at over, over, over and over again, you say, if someone says to you, hey, the box office wasn't great this summer, oh, that sucks, you know, what happened? How much was it off overall? And you're going to be like, well, you know, overall, it's technically off about 570 million bucks, which is a lot, over half a billion dollars. Um, that seems really bad. It changes the, the picture when you realize that 670 million uh, was actually lost from the end of June until through August in that two month period because the losses sort of are so severe and they're sort of just never, they just get worse and worse and worse and they're confined to this this two month period. Uh, it suggests that something's pretty off. Um, now, you know, what's happening? Why did all of a sudden was there a box office crash um, in the last couple of months? There's a million reasons why, right? Like. Um, Oh, people are going on vacation, and especially for August, um, you know, movies like Dark Tower didn't play very well, like they should have. There's a lot of different ways you can look at it, but when you're looking just at the numbers, something significant has happened. And when you include this weekend, which is the worst weekend since 9/11, so you're kind of 16 years. It, it, it paints an even sort of, um, I don't want to say darker picture, but it sort of fits into the narrative that I'm talking about. This wasn't an off summer. There was a box office collapse in July and August, a total collapse um, that, you know, I have to look at, I could look at the week and week. If I had like a SQL database, I could do this in like an hour, but I don't. Um, it feels like one of the worst runs of the box office that I've ever seen, uh, especially during a summer like this. Um, when you're off, you know, I said, what, 670 for um, since about June 23rd? So it was actually wrong. Um, the total loss so far from last year um, at the box office is more than that 670 because I you know, include this weekend. Uh, it's over seven hundred million dollars, just in these last two months. Uh, and the, the question is, okay, so this happened. The box office lost seven hundred million dollars from last year. 
that's a huge chunk. That's not a small amount. That's not even close to a small amount. Um, the fact that it even happened is a big story. Uh, the fact that it happened over a two month period is a big story. Uh, and the fact that it happened during summer is a massive story. And when you combine those all together, I think that's the lead story of this summer is what happened in the last two months that caused this bubble to just burst all of a sudden. Um, and you know, maybe it was a perfect storm scenario, but you know, if you just sort of think about just generally what's been happening, a lot of the more established films, um, that were supposed to play well earlier, um, this summer didn't like, I'm looking at pirates. I'm looking at transformers. Um, I mean, Baywatch is pretty early in the summer, so you can't really can't really place some blame on that for the box office crash in July and August. Um, but stuff like Dark Tower definitely played a role in it. Also, you know, there's also the fact that like they didn't really the studios didn't put out anything in early to mid August that was gonna make 300, 400 million dollars like a Suicide Squad. Like it just I think they thought Dark Tower might be that. But they only spent what ninety million bucks on that, um, so maybe you could say, "Hey, like it's just it was a really shitty July. Things didn't go well, and they didn't really schedule out in August. That could be it." Um, and then maybe this September with it and stuff, I think things will take off. Um, but I do think that there's something something here. When you lose seven hundred million dollars over a two month period. Um, it is a crash. Like, I don't think there's any way else you can look at it. You look at the rest of the year, uh, you look at 2014, and the losses are, are, are somewhat, I don't want to say uniform, um, but they're not as sudden and catastrophic as this as they've been this summer. Um, you know, like through June, through June of this year, you know, we were up $200 million at the box office. Two months later, you know, we're, we're down what over half a billion dollars, basically you know, half a billion, um, with this $700 million loss in the last two months, you know, I think that, um, to me, that is a story that needs to be talked about. That needs to be analyzed and, you know, it needs to be thought about as to, you know, not as necessarily like you know, a post mortem like we used to do, like the companies I work for, it's like, hey, what the fuck happened? Like, it's less about what the fuck happened and more about what does this mean about the box office moving forward? Is this a moment? Is this the canary in the coal mine? Coal mine that um, is is sort of informing us of, of a large change in the industry. Um, I think that it is. Like the the numbers that I'm seeing and I'm looking at, they and this is there's a reason why um, the box uh, the movie theater industry lost you know uh, so much of its value at the stock market this summer. You know the analysts on the Wall Street they look at this stuff, right? You know the amateurs like me, yeah, you know, we look at this stuff every once in a while. The box office writers, yeah, they sort of skim along the surface. Um, but the people who are buying and selling the stocks of AMC and Regal, they just absolutely look at this stuff and they say, look at your business. Like, where's it going? Your product, you know, the revenue at the box office in this business suddenly dropped $700 million in two months. Like, to me, that reads sell, get out. I mean, where's your, you know, it's not, it seems like the industry is crashing on some level. Now, the Wall Street people are prone to sort of, the chicken little sky is falling syndrome, right? Like they, that's just what they do. And then the next week they're buying it back. I and mean, it is a lot of back and forth, but there is something to be said to the fact that they started selling off the, the AMC stock and Regal stock. Um, I think it was Regal. I can't remember some company or all the movie theater companies lost about a billion dollars in value in a week, I believe. So something is happening and it's not just bullshit, uh, box office riders looking for clickbait, which sometimes they do. Um, there's something something big happening at the box office. And, you know, at, at the end of the year, we're going to look back and say, hey, was this just another 2014 summer where things were down and it's just, you know, the, a lot of the movies, like back in 2014, I think it was like Amazing Spider-Man 2 just like collapsed. 
uh, kind of like Pirates did this year and, and Transformers. We're going to look back and basically be like, it was just like a one-off summer. Or was this a harbinger of something bigger that was happening? My gut says it's something bigger. Um, just because of the way the losses happened. It was just like the legs for the summer just gave out. And there was nothing left. Uh, and there's a lot of people that want to see movies in July and August. Believe me. Um, and it's always been two of the bigger months of the year. Especially July. Uh, August is sort of a toss-up, right? And we're all going to walk through the top ten here in a bit. Um, it is sort of a toss-up, and depending on it's Suicide Squad, may you know seems like it probably was a special August last year, just because Suicide Squad did so well. So maybe you know, looking at comparison this to this year, last year, maybe last year was just a really high August, and you could totally make that argument without a doubt. Um, but to see the box office just sort of just. If it was one or two weeks in a row, I'd be like, all right, whatever. And it was kind of back and forth, kind of like what 2014 was. Um, and just ended up being a pretty big loss overall. But it was, you know, one week was up, one week was really down, essentially. Um, the sort of off the cliff. And it's 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 interesting, too, because when you look at these losses compared to last year, the difference is, you know, if you start out the last week in June, it's off 3%. We're down 3%. Uh, the week of July 4th, we're down 6%. The next week, we're down 7%. Then we're down 19%. Um, and then it sort of evens out. But then the last three weeks specifically, the first week of August was off 20%. Um, two weeks ago, it was off 26%. And this last um, week, not in this last weekend, the last week was off 38%. I don't think this week could be worse than that. So you're seeing not only losses, but um, exponentially worse losses. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. So that's why I'm sort of, it feels like a, a box office collapse to me. Um, but you know what? Uh, you know, I, I, we'll see what happens in the fall. Maybe this, maybe people are just waiting to go to movies to see, to see in the fall. Um, I doubt that the, it, the bleeding will stop on September 8th. I know that for a fact. It is going to be massive and huge, but I don't think it in and of itself is going to be big enough to sort of offset what's happened in, in July and August. And so we'll see where we're at the end of the year. We got a new Star Wars movie coming out. Come on. Like, it's going to be huge, right? Um, but one wonders, one wonders, you know, The Force Awakens and Rogue One and the comic book movies, um, outside of those, how healthy this industry is. Um, my gut says that it's going through a massive transition and no one really knows where it's going to land. I don't think the movie theaters understand at all what is happening. Uh, and a good example of that is I think one of the bigger stories of this last month at the box office was MoviePass changing its uh, platform and its pricing. Um, so if you don't know what MoviePass is, MoviePass has been around since 2011. I've been using it for a couple of years. I can't remember where I heard about it. When I heard about it, I was like, wait a second. What is this? This can't be real. Um, MoviePass is essentially a subscription service um, for going to see movies at the movie theater. Right? And you basically, how it works is you sign up for the service. There's a phone app. Um, you get a debit card from MoviePass. It has your name on it. Um, when you want to go see a movie, you show up at the movie theater, you check in on your phone for the movie, you click it, and then you walk up, use the debit card. Um, it works. They Their IP, and I actually, I'm actually from the payment industry originally, uh, it blows my mind how they do this. Because they basically activate your debit card for about 20, or I don't even know how long, maybe 10 minutes. And then you use that debit card to pay for your ticket, just like it was a normal credit card, and then you're in. And you basically pay them, the pricing was all over the place for a while. I was paying about 30 bucks a month for this. And the deal is you can go once every 24 hours to a movie. So if you went to a lot of movies, the average movie ticket's nine bucks, right? So if you went to more than, um, th if you went to four movies a month, you would be saving some money, right? Now that doesn't include concessions, obviously are a completely different story and like whatever. Um, but they raised the price to about 
45 bucks, 40 bucks recently, and the pricing has been fluctuating a lot to the point where um, it almost kind of seemed like it might be a good deal, um, but it was kind of on that borderline. And then what happened a couple weeks ago, uh, the CEO of MoviePass, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, but um, he's worked for, for a lot of disruptive companies and he knows what he's doing. He knows uh, how to take on the movie theater industry, I think. Um, and he made an announcement and said, we're now moving to a $10 per month fee to see as many movies as you want, whenever you want. Um, and it basically broke the internet and Reddit. Like when they made the announcement, it was all of a sudden everybody and his brother knew what Movie Pass was and wanted or wanted to know more about it. Before that, it was a pretty quiet service. Not a lot of people were using it. I sort of came across it randomly a few years ago, uh, and just because I'm a huge movie buff, uh, it made sense to me because I like going to the movie theater. Um, but even at that thirty, forty dollar price, it felt kind of weird because you, I don't know, you felt like you had to go to meet that minimum money that you've already put in. Um, and the hard part about that was that I live in Tennessee and, um, you know, there's movie theaters here that I can go see a movie on a Saturday afternoon for like five bucks. It's just very cheap here. And I think that's, that's the case for a lot of places in America. If you go at off times, um, you can find some really good bargains. So for me, if I could buy a ticket for six bucks and it was $30, I'd have to go five times a month. And it just sort of like, I ended up stopped using it because I was like, eh, like it's not really saving me that much money. Um, and so I sort of parted ways with it. But then they made this announcement for $10, um, $10 a month for unlimited movies. You know, it's 30 days a month, 31 days. You could see, 30, see a movie 30 times if you wanted to. Um, but that pricing was outrageous. And it basically set off this wildfire on the internet and everybody in the, everybody every, basically their user base was at like 20 30,000 I think and now it's well over 150 200,000 within two weeks that's how much they they popped up um and there's a lot of reasons why it, it was the right move right like they probably were floundering a bit as a company they needed to rapidly increase their customer base uh, and they could always cap it off. They basically said, hey, we're gonna do this 10 bucks a month for the next year, locking the price for a year. Um, and then they're probably gonna cut it off at like maybe 250,000 people, right? Um, they're gonna use that as, as leveraging power against the studios and basically say, hey, AMC, hey, Regal, um, here is your most lucrative group of customers. And if you look at you know, the numbers in the MPAA report at the end of the year, they run through all this stuff. And the people who drive most of the revenue at the box office are frequent moviegoers. And I can't remember what the threshold for is for that, but it's like they go to, the average person goes to about four movies a year. These people go to like at least three times that, like 12. Um, so that's the most lucrative group for the theaters to, to market and get in the door. And basically, MoviePass, on some level, beat them to the punch. Because AMC and Regal, I think, were both working on subscription services for their theaters. Um, but MoviePass was around earlier, and they just they pulled the trigger and said, hey, we're going to we're gonna basically make this as cheap as we possibly can and get in a few hundred thousand people to our customer base, and then they're going to have a lot of power in that industry because they can sway people. It's the AMC is trying to, uh, AMC basically responded and said, this is insane. We're gonna cut off some of our services with MoviePass. The, the problem with that, the cat's out of the bag, right? Like the immense popularity of the announcement demonstrated that people love going to the movie theater. It's just a really, it's a really fun experience for a lot of people and it's still, it's never going to go away, at least it's not going to go away anytime soon, even with the home theater and the streaming and the quality of home entertainment never never being better than it has been right now, and it will always get better and better. 
um, people still just want to go to the movie theater. Um, and that pricing really showed that. And it showed a huge weakness in the industry in that tickets are way overpriced, I think is what it really comes down to. And they have been overpriced for a long time. And that happened, you know, tickets, basically what's been happening in the industry. And I'm starting to go on like a long ramp, but uh, I'll, I'll eventually get to the top 10, but I kind of wanted to touch on a lot of this stuff before I got there. Just because this top 10 is pretty, pretty boring. Um, basically what's been happening since the 90s, there's a huge boom in building movie theaters uh, throughout the 90s. Um, you know, uh, ticket admissions were fantastic in the mid 2000s. Just people were going to movies left and right. I don't know if it was because of the war that was going on or in post 9-11 or we were in a we were technically in a an economic boom until about 2007 so maybe a lot of that had to do with it but there were a lot of theaters built um, and tickets just kind of going up and then the recession happened people stopped going to the as movies as much and what theaters have been doing sort of offset the lower amount of people going to films in the movie theater is increasing ticket prices but you can't just increase ticket prices and expect people are going to keep showing up you know, basic economic principle says if you increase the price, the demand's going to go down, right? Um, and so what they've done is they've done the 3D. That's why 3D became so big, because that was a way to get people to pay more per visit. That is the key of the movie industry right now. How do we increase the amount of money they're coming in per visit? Um because they see the number of visits as always dwindling. And that's what they've seen in the, in the business for a long time now. Um, they, they, it's kind of a cynical p play when you think about it. When you're setting up your business model, assuming that the number of people that are going to use your product is going to continue to go down. But I think that's essentially what they've been doing. Uh, that's why you had 3D. That's where you had luxury seating. That's why you have reserve seating. Um, these are all ways to increase the amount of money per visit that someone's spending. Um, you know, movie tickets, the average movie ticket is about nine bucks now. But of course, if you go to any 3D IMAX or more luxury reserve seating, um, I tried to go to a show over here in uh, Green Hills. It's kind of the nicer theater over by me. It's like $15 on a Saturday on a matinee, 15 or something like that across the street here at the old car mic which is now amc because amc bought out car mic goes like it's like five bucks to go to the movie on a saturday uh but the reason it's 15 at green hills is they have reserve city it's much nicer uh it's leather reclining seats you know so it, it feels almost worth 15 dollars, right and so that's what the theaters have been doing what the movie pass thing did was basically say that um, hey, we think your model, your business model is wrong, right? We think the real attraction to uh, the movie industry and the box office going to a movie is seeing the movie in and of itself. It's not the seats. Uh, it's not even the concessions. or It's not even necessarily the overall experience. It's just people want to see a movie on the big screen. And the extra periphery stuff is fine, um, but that's not why they go, right? They don't go to see Star Wars four times because the seats are nice, right? They go because they want to see Star Wars on a massive screen with amazing sound, right? What they can't get at their home. Or they want to see it with people, right? There's always like, especially when you're thinking about like, big box office films or big tent poles. Um, you want to see them with a lot of people or it's fun, especially the comic book movies, like MCU films. Like if you want to go see like Wonder Woman by yourself with like three people in the theater, that's an insanely different experience or see it at home on VOD, which I'll probably do. Uh, Cause I haven't seen it yet. Um, uh, seeing it, uh, you know, on VOD or on your TV versus like a full pa packed house you know, it's a completely different experience. And that's especially true for, I think, horror movies and comedies, uh, especially comedies where it's like, you wanna laugh with everybody and have a good time, right? So MoviePass basically said, that's what people want. People want a communal experience and they wanna see it on the big screen. This extra stuff that you're charging for, people really don't give a fuck about, is what it comes down to. They don't fucking care. Uh, and I think that they're right. I think that movie pass gets it, whereas the movie theaters industry does not. 
um, they're kind of playing it very in a cynical way. Um, whereas Movie Pass, I think, understands why people go to the movie theaters in the first place. And so by charging 10 bucks a month, maybe that's unsustainable. Like maybe that's not um, a way to do it, but it is essentially like a gym membership model, right? You know, you pay, you pay to go whenever you want to go, and you show up whenever you want to go. You don't own the equipment, you don't own the showers, but you can use the showers whenever you want to, or use the equipment whenever you want to. I mean, uh, and that's essentially what what Movie Pass is trying to do. And of course, the movie theater industry is going to be like, absolutely not, no, 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 no. They're going to dig their heels in on this. They really are. Because they see it as threatening their entire business, right? They want to make, um, you know, they want to make uh, a more more money per visit. That's how they see it. They don't see it any other way, and that's the way that their mindset has been going for the last at least ten years. It, is they see movie theater attendance dropping off because of all this competition, um, and they see it as sort of like. Um, how do we get more money out of people, essentially? Which is such a shitty way of viewing a business because it's just, I don't, the economics of it are just dumb. They're stupid, right? Like you have this product uh, that you can give to people, then they love it, and you're making them feel shitty about it, essentially. Uh, and you're fleecing them, right? Uh, and they're sort of, they're sort of concocting their own demise because the more you charge per ticket, the less people are going to go. It's just exacerbating that competition problem, right? Um, if I had to pay, let's say I had a family of four and I want to go to a movie on a Friday night or something like that and see a new movie, you know, if I want to do it right, you know, get four tickets, get some popcorn and some, and some soda, you know, you're looking at like, man, well over 60 bucks probably maybe even higher maybe like 80 or some people in like new york but like 100 bucks for for that right um now compare that to or you order pizza and you get something on netflix netflix is like what 20 bucks a month 15 bucks a month not even um the cost is you know it's one fourth the cost uh, now is it the same experience no um but it's not that it's not technically that far off um it's more comfortable, I'll tell you that much. Um, so, you know, essentially, movie pass and that whole thing, and if you if you sort of throw that on this bonfire of this this shitty summer, um, it 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 basically says to me that like, wow, there are some massive changes happening that I thought were coming. I thought about mm, seven eight years ago. The moment Netflix started streaming movies online, because that was only seven years ago, about the moment they started streaming movies online, I realized that the industry was going to, it was never going to be the same. Just never going to be the same. Um, you know, the heydays of the mid 2000s when tons of people were going to theaters, Spider Man 2 was coming out. Like, it was, it was really hunky dory time. <laughs> Those are gone, right? And the, and the, the business will change it has to change if it wants to continue to be you know what i don't know how many billion dollars it is a year uh i think it's like when you all included it's probably like what 16 billion dollars in the united states maybe more um and so you know when you look at all that in the big picture like this box office collapse this in the last two months kind of fits into this overall narrative that the business is in transition is the business overall collapsing absolutely not i think people will always want to go to movies and the response to movie passes dropping of their price to see as many movies as you want um, suggests to me that there is a massive huge pent-up demand that has not been met for seeing movies in the theater so that to me that suggests that the industry is actually quite healthy it's just being misorganized and mismanaged by the theaters uh and depending on how this movie pass thing plays out i know amc is trying to go to war with them uh it's gonna be hard though because movie pass uses mastercard debit cards you can't just turn off mastercard not gonna happen 
Um, it's going to be war for a while, uh, but we'll see how that plays out. But I think that is the direction um, movies will and the movie industry will go in. Um, and I think I don't know what that's going to do to revenues overall, but I do know that going to a subscription model uh, is a more accurate reflection of how people's wa- people want to see movies. Right. You know, especially like someone like who who's super into like comic book movies or like Spider-Man or whatever. Um, or like I'm, I think Wonder Woman is a good, a good example of this. Uh, people have probably seen Wonder Woman who are really into it like three or four times. Right. Do you want to pay 15 bucks three times to go see it? No. Um, will you go, you know, if you had to pay 10 bucks a month, how many times would you see it in a month? I think a lot of people would go like five, six times, to be honest with you. Um, that only helps the movie industry. That only helps them. They don't see that, though. They see it as a threat to their revenue, right? They see it as a threat to that, how much money can I get per visit model? They don't see it as, what if I had people coming three times as much as they normally do? What could I do then as a movie theater owner? Well, think about concessions. I mean, that's where they make all their... That's the biggest profit margin for a movie theater is concessions. It's like an 80% profit margin. Um, so there's, I think they, they're going to have to rethink their business is essentially what it comes down to. Um, not only because of the movie pass sort of threat or sort of changing of the business model, uh, but also because um, they're just not doing well anymore, movies at the box. They're just not. Um, and, you know, we're off about, what half a billion dollars this year maybe the fall makes it up maybe the winter makes it up maybe you know the new star wars the last jedi i think that's what it's called right um makes everything hunky dory again and everybody's happy uh but this summer suggests that there's something significantly different about the way the business is moving um and you can point to a lot of different things but i think overall it's just the way the business has been created charging what they're charging for tickets um, just doesn't really work anymore. And I'm really excited to see how Movie Pass does. And you know what? Like, even if Movie Pass fails, um, an AMC or Regal or whoever comes out with their own sort of subscription service, I think that's a win. You know, even if the subscription service is like 30 bucks a month, you know, if the average person goes to a, a movie four times a year, um, you know, four times let's average ticket prices, uh, um, nine bucks. That's thirty six dollars in revenue per person per capita, right? That they're getting. Um, what if you could bump that up a bit? You know, what if you could get, um, you know, if you're charging thirty bucks a month, um, to those people, you're making three hundred sixty dollars per capita off those people. That's a pretty massive jump. Right, and you think about it. What does it cost them to have more people come to the theater? Nothing, right? Maybe a few more workers, uh, but that's probably it. Like, there's just empty seats, and they can play, play the movies whenever they want to. That's why the movie pass thing makes so much sense to me, because you have this unused capital. You have seats, you have theaters, you have screens. The overhead and cost is not very high to run those things. If you could get more people cycling in and out of those theaters, making more money in concessions, and just getting more butts in the seats, I think everybody wins at the end of the day. And MoviePass sees that. AMC and Regal do not. Uh, and they could they could kind of get screwed. The one who, the one huge theater chain that sees it first is going to win. And I don't know if they're then going to sort of take over Um, But if AMC keeps pushing back, they might be in trouble because that's what people want. Never go against the consumer, especially the mass consumer. Um, They're always going to win. So that was sort of my little discussion on um, the box office collapse of this summer. Um, The big takeaway to me is it's a lot worse than people think that it is. That byline, oh, it was an off-summer, doesn't really capture how negative the last two months have been um, and how the bubble essentially popped and this weekend and the next weekend have are not going to make it they're going to make it much much worse uh, we're talking losses you know we're all over we're, all, we're already over 700 million dollars for the last two months it's and this labor day weekend is going to be pretty atrocious um 
So, you know, it's like, how far is this going to go down? Now everything's, everyone's going to sigh, uh, going to have a sigh of relief when it comes out. Obviously, that's what's going to happen. I know it. But I don't know. Like the 700, let's say it's like 750 million loss. That's going to be hard to make up. Like it really is. Even with Star Wars coming out, it's going to be hard to make up. So we'll see where we're at the end of the year. Um, so that's kind of that sort of overview of the summer and what's been happening. Uh, I want to do a quick walk through the top 10. I'm already kind of getting near the hour mark. I don't want to go too long and bore everybody, but um, you know, if you listen to this, this podcast, I think you're, you're already deeply, um, deeply bought into box office nerd nerdery. So I'm not going to hold back that much. Um, so, okay, this weekend, the 25th to the 27th, weekend actuals are out today. It's Monday. Um, the winner was Hitman's Bodyguard, uh, 10.2 million, a 52% drop, which is okay. Um, not fantastic, but pretty average uh, for a drop. Averages, 50% drops are pretty average in general for a large release. Um, has $39 million so far. Um, overall take on this one, it's actually already up on streaming. Uh, so I don't know what happened, but Hitman's Bodyguard was released on um, Japan's Netflix service like last week, and now it's already up on the sites, like the sort of like pirated sites and stuff like that, as an HD rip. So I don't know what they were like. I li- there's some website where they do streaming. I'm not gonna say what it is, but it's already up there, and it's like you just watch it like it's on Netflix. It, I don't know whoever made that choice was an idiot to be honest with you because um now everybody in the world can watch it online for free in hd uh who's gonna go see it this weekend terrible terrible choice by them um you know man i could just talk about this stuff forever but i feel like with that thing it's like hitman's bodyguard why don't you just let it go for like a couple of months then drop it on streaming or maybe just let it go into theaters for a month pull it put it on vod for a month pull it put it on streaming for them then put it on streaming you know, like the why they just gotta be a lot more creative with this because people's um people's viewing habits are changing so rapidly and they want stuff immediately right now on their computer um any event so hitman's bodyguard okay drop um about 52 percent drop 10.2 million annabelle creation 7.6 million 50 percent drop nearly about 51 percent actually uh, per 30 average was 2,155. Overall take so far in Annabelle Creation, 78 million bucks on a $15 million production budget. Um, highly successful. A lot better than I think anybody expected. Um, and we'll see where the, you know, the the Conjuring universe with Annabelle, uh, first and the second, Conjuring 1 and 2, and then the Nun coming out, I believe, next year. Um, really su- highly successful, um, not in just terms of box office numbers, but I think in terms of profit, right? Because the production budgets are so low on those films, and they do so well. Um, they just know what they're doing over there. James Wan, Blumhouse, they're just they're crushing it. Uh, number three was an opener, uh, Leap. Um, opened on 2,500 screens, had a pretty abysmal, absolutely awful um, $1,800 per theater average for about $4.7 million total. Um, This was a dump, there's no other way to put it. Um, Weinstein Company just dumped it in August because they didn't know what to do with it. I believe it is a French film, a French animation film. Um, Kind of, I don't know, I don't know what they were thinking. Why even release this? Put it on Netflix so kids can watch it and move on. Um, Breaking into the top four uh, with a a sort of wider release was Wind River. Um, which I saw and loved. One of my favorite film movies of the year. Uh, 4.6 million um, per theater average on the 2,100 screens was not great. Um, $2,200 per theater. Total take so far is about 10 million. Um, this was a weird movie to release in August. Uh, very strange. LA Times just put up an article about how this year, August was Sundance month, and I'll talk a little bit more about the other movies involved uh, with that byline. Um, Wind River is certainly a part of that. It's definitely an artier film that normally would play in an October, November, December time frame. Um, but for whatever reason, they put it out in August. It did pretty well, limited, but as it's, you know, as it's expanded, despite hitting the top four, 
Um, you know, it, that per theater average tells you the story. It's under 2200 bucks on 2000 screens. It's first time being on 2000 screens. And that's not good at all. That's bad. Um, there's just not an audience for this film uh, this time of year. It's not there. Um, this is another movie, and I'll talk about you know the art films that have been coming out this August, like the LA, team, LA Times talked about. I don't really see a big place for them in the theaters anymore. They got to put these movies on streaming. Like there's just no there's no point to have them in the theater. Um, I saw Wind River. There's pretty much no reason I need to see it in the theater. Absolutely none. Like I would have loved to watch it uh, on Netflix. Or there just there needs to be almost like another service, right? Where I, mean, I talked about this a few weeks ago, where you pay 15, 20 bucks a month or something, and you get these first run, brand new, super, super well done feature films. Like, I would love to see Wind River and Ingrid Goes West, and even something like The Big Sick. The Big Sick did okay on wide release, not great. It's under 40 million bucks. Um, but there just seems to be a, a, a huge gap in the marketplace, right? Like Wind River, I don't know. It, sh- it shouldn't really be in the theaters, I don't think. Uh, Logan Lucky was number five, a uh, decent 44% drop, 4.2 million. Uh, per theater average is awful. They're all awful this week. $1,400 uh, $1, per theater. Total take so far was $14 million. Uh, this is a big flop. Big, big flop for uh, Steven Soderbergh. Uh, basically, it was an experimental film. Not in terms of the actual film. The film looked pretty standard Ocean's Eleven ripoff. But the way it was produced, the way it was marketed, was a huge experiment by Soderbergh, and it did not pay off. Um, number six was Dunkirk with a great 40% drop. Just under $4 million for the weekend. Lost about 500 theaters. Total tech so far is $172 million with a good uh, foreign take as well. Uh, Dunkirk is looking more and more like a bigger win. I think when it first started, um, when it first came out in the first couple weeks, I was like, ah, it's doing okay. It kind of gives Christopher Nolan um, sort of more leeway in his next film because, like, he this is his project, and he wanted to see it. He wanted to do it exactly in the way he did it, and it was successful. Uh, this is a bigger win, I think, overall than than I thought thought it was about a month ago. It just keeps playing well. Uh, number seven was Spider Man Homecoming. Uh, 2.8 million, continuing continuing to have these fantastic uh, late uh, legs. I mean, I just uh, my mind's blown by how well it's done in the last month. Um, you know, the first month it was out, it would, did okay. People were questioning whether it was going to make 300 million. Uh, now it's well past 300 million. It's at 319 million dollars so far. Um, over a 2.7x multiplier from its open. So uh, it's kind of, you know, it's a win. It's an absolute win, and especially in the last month. Uh, number eight was Birth of Dragon. Um, this is, um, I guess, a kung fu movie, I think, uh, by Blumhouse Tilt. Um, 2.7 million, uh, opened on 1,600 screens. Uh, per theater average was just under $1,700 per theater. Uh, just like Leap, this was a dump. I don't know what they were thinking. This is straight to VOD, total waste of time. Uh, number nine was actually the Mayweather and McGregor fight. Um, Fan, uh, Phantom does like these in theater experiences, events. Um, and this one broke into the the top 10. Uh, actually had the best per theater average, which makes sense because it's kind of an event thing. I think it costs a little bit more. Um, but that was um, just about $5,000 per theater for the fight. Um, pretty cool, which is something they might start doing more, maybe. Um, I don't know. It seems like a cool model. Uh, number 10 was the um, Emoji movie, which I fucking hate talking about. Uh, $2.5 million, uh, just about $1,000 per theater. Currently at $76 million bucks. Um So I, wanna go, I don't want to go on too long more since I did, you know, spent the opening 50 minutes talking about sort of the box office crash this summer. Um, I do things I do want to highlight though. Um, there, uh, speaking of the LA Times article that came out, um, basically talking about these limited move feature, these limited art house films that are getting put out in August and how it's kind of strange. Um, I agree that it is strange. Uh, I don't understand it. Um, uh, looking at Wind River, let's look at Inger Goes West. 
um, good time on A24. Um, Ingrid goes west. I already talked about Wind River. Ingrid, Ingrid goes west expanded to 600 theaters this weekend. Um, horrific per theater average. $1,200 per theater on 600 theaters. Awful. Uh, total take so far is $1.3 million. Um, just a complete waste of time. I, it seems like an awesome movie. I hear Aunt Audrey Plaza is fantastic in it. I hear um, Elizabeth Olsen's fantastic in it. Um, it seems like a really good movie. Has no place in the August box office. I don't know what they're thinking. I, it makes zero sense to put this outside of New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. That would be it. Those are the only cities I would play it in. Play it there for a few weeks. Uh, maybe put it on VOD for a month or a couple of weeks. And then just put it out on streaming. There's just no reason why this is being expanded to over 20 theaters. Doesn't make any sense. Good Time maybe had a bigger play in more urban markets. Not going to play outside urban markets. Not going to happen. Um opens uh, increased to 700 theaters this weekend an increase of it's at 721 theaters which is an increase from 20 theaters than it wasn't last week per theater average 806 dollars huge mistake huge huge mistake no audience for this outside those it's not even that there's no audience it's just like it's not marketed correctly um the marketing on this has been atrocious um, the trailer, the first trailer that dropped was really, really good. So good that I tweeted about it on our never tweet. I was like, this looks amazing. Um, it just looks like a huge, like a really interesting, rich A24 film. Like it had such a good hook to it. And then they just threw it out in August and then tried to expand it wide and it collapses. Like its legs got cut out from underneath it. Um, I almost like I'm angry about it on some level, and I am. I feel like, I feel like they fucked this film. Um, and A24 is, you know, has been doing so well. They're an upstart. They're competing with Fox Searchlight and the the imprints and Focus Features, and they just screwed this up. And the and it sucks because I think it's probably a pretty good movie. Um, and more than more than that, I know that it's a pretty good movie, and I know that it is an interesting, artistically rich film. Right, and so from an artistic perspective, it is frustrating to see a movie like this get made um, and then just die at the multiplex. And there's no reason that it needed to happen. Um, this is why I feel like there's this gap in the marketplace where there needs to be a service um, where I can see Ingrid Goes West, I can see the, the Good Time, I can see uh, another one I'm going to talk about. I can't even find it here on the list. Where did it go? Um, uh, oh, Columbus is another one that just just opens. That's going nowhere too, man. That sucks. But that's like a really really art house film. Columbus. It looks amazing. It's on twenty two screens. Did two thousand nine hundred dollars per screen, and that's terrible. Um, a uh, Penny Cakes, a big Sundance acquisition uh, that got pushed out to um, forty five. It's on fifty nine theaters. 59 theaters it's per theater average is $1,700 on 59 theaters like that's a, a debacle um there you know and that that one might be a harder sell than even good time or anger goes west but it's an art film it was sold at Sundance it's meant to be an art film for art houses like there's no reason and, and patty cakes failed even on the art house circuit right there's just and does it a bad film? No, I don't think so. I think it's a great film. The the reaction to it at Sundance was fantastic. There's just no longer a path for these films in the marketplace. It just doesn't exist, um, especially on a wider outside of the single art house theater in every major city, right? It, maybe it'll play there. Uh, maybe it's a chance to do something there. But is that worth it? Is it? That's the big question to me. You know, in, in Nashville, there's the Bell Court. That's the art house theater here. You know, we're a city of I don't know, 1.5 million or something like that. Big city, right? Um, there's one really true art house, th art house theater. Does Patty Cakes play there? And Columbus is actually playing there. I'm going to see it sometime. Um, but Patty Cakes is that? Should that play there? Right? Should you get the? Fifty thousand dollars in revenue that you're going to get from that theater alone—that makes zero sense. 
Like this is a movie that should be seen by a lot of people. Um, it's kind of a waste of time to put it in our an art art house. The, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. It should be on streaming immediately with a really good marketing push um, from Netflix or Amazon. It's like, hey, look at this really cool, interesting film. More people would see it. I don't know. It feel I feel like in the long run, it might be a better business play as well. Um, but no, now it's going to sit in Nowheresville for the next three or four months before it premieres on anything. So I don't know. I'm just terrible. Um, but the overall point is that like there needs to be a different service or a different path for the Sundance art house films because it's not worth it anymore. Um, okay. Enough of my ranting. I've gone on a long, it's a long episode. Hopefully you're still with me. If not, that's okay. I totally understand. Um, even I get sick of my own voice sometimes. Um, so what's going to happen this next weekend, right? What is going on? It's Labor Day weekend. We have two openers, folks. We have Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the re-release. Why? I mean, it's a cool film. Actually, I might go see that. Now that I'm thinking, that sounds awesome. Actually, I might go see that. Um, but again, not a real release. Uh, Tulip Fever, which is an art house film, getting released on six different theaters. Uh, maybe it breaks out. It's not going to. I can tell you this right now. Great cast, though. Looks like a great movie, but no major audience for that movie. Uh, especially Labor Day weekend. I don't know what they are thinking. Uh, and then it's all quiet, essentially, until um, it comes out on September 8th. And I feel like I've just been like, I feel like I'm on the, the It hype team. I'm super excited for it. I think everybody in this country is super excited for it. I think it's going to be maybe the biggest horror opening ever. A tr like straight horror film. Uh, it's going to break the uh, September record, I guarantee you, which is like 50 million bucks. It's going to blow past that. I'm thinking like 70, 80, maybe even higher for the weekend. Um, and then, it, you know, we settle into September and things will change a bit and we're going to the fall which is probably like my favorite movie going season is definitely probably fall and holiday. Um, <clears throat> there's just so many good movies coming up, but that's all I got. Um, Hey guys, you know, I'm on a lot of different platforms. Uh, subscribe to me on, on YouTube. I post the episodes there. I might eventually do like a video thing. I don't know if you want to see my face. I have the face for radio, so I might stick to podcasts, but I'm going to do a little bit of a promotional push, um, uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, and the reason for that is I love doing this. Uh, I really, really like it a lot. It's a big part of, I don't know, my passion for movies. And this really uh, scratches that itch. Um, and I kind of want to build my audience a little bit more and uh, just get more people involved and see where I can go. Um, I would love to get to the point where I can um, <clears throat> do this maybe even part time and make some money from it on some level. That'd be amazing. Um, but I got to work to get there. And so, um, <clears throat> if you want to do your part, you know, just subscribe and, uh, on, on SoundCloud, it's on iTunes, whatever you need to do. Clearly I'm not the greatest like self promoter marketer. Um, but if you want to do it, just subscribe and, you know, follow me on Twitter. That's uh, I'm using Twitter a lot more. I talk about Twitter like I'm like 80 years old. Um, but the point is like, I'm trying to grow this a little bit. So like pass along to other people that you know that are in the box office stuff and have them listen and see if they like it. Uh, all right. Thanks for listening, guys. I will be back next week to talk about the abysmal Labor Day weekend. All right. Take care.